was Ariel Posen. He is this episode's guest on Guitar Players in Isolation. Ariel Posen is an internationally recognized guitar player who's toured with many Canadian country recording artists and who's also been a member of the Juno award-winning roots rock band, The Brothers Landreth. He released his debut solo album, How Long, in January of last year and just released his first single off his new album and the song is called Coming Back. If you're returning to my channel, thanks so much for the support. If you have not done so already, please subscribe and hit that bell notification button. This really helps the YouTube algorithm show up my videos so more can see them. If you are new to my channel, this is my 20th video. So lots of other amazing guests that you can check out after watching this one. If you like this kind of stuff and have friends that do so too, please share it around. Let's get started. Hey, Ariel, how are you? Hey man, I'm good, how are you? Excellent, excellent. So uh, you're, you're keeping busy during these uh, crazy COVID times. I've uh, been watching your Facebook. I've been following you for, for a while now. I'm big, I am a big fan. <laughs> it's, uh, not just saying that, but one, you're one of the few guitar players, I'd say like kind of in the last three, four years that I've become a fan of that I just really discovered on social media. You know, it wasn't <clears> like you know, some album from years ago. I kind of knew you uh, in, in Brothers Landreth, but yeah. but not a lot, right? It was it was mostly the brothers and uh, until you started doing your solo thing and then you got, you know, we'll talk about that a little later, but you, you really kind of take advantage of social media. And, you know, for me, you're kind of up there with, uh, you know, Josh Smith and, uh, and Guthrie Trap. You're kind of like my three favorites that i really discovered over social media you know well, thanks man that's some some heavy company to be uh up those guys yeah they are there's a lot of great talent out there now i think the talent has always been out there it's just now kind of like you were saying everyone's got a platform it's like an online it's not like a resume but it's it's like your portfolio it's your cv it's your way of yeah yeah you know getting yourself out especially now with not being able to perform live it's like yeah it's almost never been more useful for certain people. It's a great time to have COVID. <laughs> well, great time for COVID. No, it's a great time to be active online during COVID. <laughs> Something like that. I don't that. think it's ever a great time to have COVID. Yeah. I mean, but, if, uh, it was, if this was 1974, we'd be going crazy. <laughs> I, I keep thinking about the uh, the Spanish flu. It's like they did of uh, two years of, you know, no technology, no nothing. Yeah, I, People still not wanting to wear masks. Just like endless bullshit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's true. We're pretty lucky in that regard. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, you know, in all things, you try to find a positive out of a situation, and uh, yeah, you know, so there's, there's, a, and I mean, for me, I mean, I a week into lockdown, I started this thing, and I've gotten to meet so many incredible artists. You know, some of the guys I started off with, guys I already knew, and then it, you know, it kind of grew from there, and it's, I've been having a blast doing it, and. Kind yeah, I was checking. I was checking uh, all the people you had on. Oh, cool! Like, yeah, hey, yeah, it's all my friends. That's yeah, awesome. I, I think so. We're gonna get to that. I bet you played with quite a bit of them. Uh, yes, I have. Or if yeah. I haven't played with them, there are some good pals in there too. Excellent, excellent. So let's start off with what's really current. You're um, you just started kind of promoting uh, that you got a new song coming out, a new single called uh, "Coming Back." Yes. And uh, you were kind enough to forward that to me because it's going to be out on the 18th everywhere. And this video will probably be out a few days after that. So, Okay, so it's out already. Yeah, yeah, so it's out already. All right, so killer song. Thank uh, you. You jammed a lot into like two minutes and 58 seconds. <laughs> I hope I'm not giving away too much. But it's got a, well, you, actually, you can listen to it right now. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, a cool uh, laid back funk groove thing and, killer fuzz guitar solo and great harmonies um did you do all your own harmonies yeah i always do my own harmonies oh, uh, wow. how long as well the only time i don't do my own harmonies is live because you yeah you yeah have one voice so yeah don't use those harmonizer pedals those are uh... <laughs> yeah no the guys in the band always sing they they're great uh for the live sessions and familiar ground i had courtney and Hayda singing with me who are also some dear friends and amazing singers from Winnipeg. Oh, that's great. So nice treat to have them. But for rec on, on the records, like I do that all, I do it all myself. Oh, I mean, there's, well, listen, people will check it out. There's, 
some really nice lines going in there and those uh, some of those sections there that that was it was I, cool it was cool i enjoyed I, that and they uh, i actually i actually enjoy doing background vocals i think almost more than tracking guitar i mean yeah. in terms of like in recording yeah it's yeah such a, it's hard and it's frustrating at times but it's also incredibly satisfying to hear like yeah. a really good blend and really good part put together because you can just get we tend to get really carried away we i mean uh my co-producer and i murray pulver right it's oh, really yeah. easy to just go overboard just like it is on guitar too sure, but, sure. <clears throat> uh i definitely love it we, we we definitely there's a lot there's a lot on coming back but compared to what how long was like how long we spent days on you know just on seven or eight seven songs i mean it's yeah. a 10 song record but seven songs have vocals and we went to town to a point where it was like when we sh i started playing these songs live and i'd i'd been <laughs> the background vocals like everyone who's playing was like uh this is a little much i'm like yeah you're totally right so i had to like totally simplify and rearrange all the harmonies just to make it work yeah, for yeah. Live, so to speak uh, yeah um, i mean so yeah there's still all that if you liked all that stuff uh for this song and all the new stuff that's coming it's all the same elements but try to uh try to chill a bit <laughs> every time you do something you're learning right so it's uh and it's changing yeah. right so yeah so my question is which I, i'm pretty positive the answer is yes uh you're releasing the single uh coming back but is it part of a full album that you put together maybe <laughs> uh, it is it is yeah, okay no secret it's no secret there um I'm just not really saying much more about it at this point, but yeah, there is a new album coming. This is the first. That's great. First That's great. That. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, very excited. So possibly uh, the plan is kind of to kind of drip it out a little bit before you make the whole album. No, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would have been doing that without a pandemic, anyways. Yeah. You know, like when you're putting out music, the second that your stuff hits Spotify, Apple Music, and uh, you know, just the whole album was out there. You're yeah. kind of not like there's nothing else to yeah, say. What else are you gonna else. do? Yeah, you know. So you, yeah. your your strategy, well, not even your strategy, but your cycle is kind of over. So that's when you really have to rely on going on the road. Yeah, uh, doing that type of thing. So it's all about the lead up. Well, actually, I had a question about that uh, a little later on, but it fits right now. So you did all the back work of you know promoting it, and you know you're hiring publishers and uh, publicists and road managers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, the whole hiring thing, uh, it means you're spending money. So this time around, you're putting out, a, you know, starting out with the, with the first single. How are things going to change a little bit? Because you kind of don't have the gigging revenue to offset the expenses of promoting a new album. So what's kind of the thought process uh, this time around? Well, you're totally right. I mean, if life was normal right now, I... I would still be in and out like almost every weekend of this past summer would have been traveling on the road. Sure, the sure. Yeah. And then with the announcement of this single coming out, uh, if I wasn't in the middle of it already, uh, I would have been hitting the road without all that. Everything becomes a digital focused mm -hmm. strategy really. And yeah, you know, there, there's a lot of costs that are, you know, a lot of people are going to be not recouping yeah. from investments and, projects they put money to before this all went down and that's just how it is you know we really have to hope that you can make that money back in other ways you really yeah. hope that you can still sell physical copies which i'll definitely be depending on yeah and yeah. i i know that i have a loyal fan base so far and they like to have physical stuff so people aren't yeah. just yeah. stuck in the digital age I, i'm trying not to get too caught up in that I, honestly yeah. i just want to do justice to the music i just want to get it out into the world yeah do it the yeah. right way to make it in like the business and like the music business in terms of not like the record industry i'm talking just like whether you're a guitar player for hire or an artist or in a band you just gotta i've said this in a million interviews you really <laughs> just gotta hustle and you gotta yeah, yeah. Yeah. have different avenues you can't, yeah. it can't just be one thing well, so, you've, been, you've been doing great at that well i i'm tr i try i just i don't like to settle on one thing that's how yeah. i've always been like that so excellent yeah I, I just you know i'm fortunate that i can have a couple different avenues that are still under the umbrella of music and still help me feel inspired and creative like luckily 
I still have a lot of music to work on for myself and for other artists. I'm producing a couple records right now. You've mentioned in some other interviews, you're, uh, you're back to doing some more, uh, some se- session work and uh, some Skype stuff. And then you got the True Fire stuff. So yeah, you got, you got a lot of things going on. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a handful. I'm, I'm fortunate in that regard for sure. Um, although you, you do really miss, I don't, I don't necessarily miss the traveling. Like I had to fly <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like a, a month ago and it was really annoying. Like I, I fly maybe 80 to 90 times a year usually. Wow. Yeah. And I'm used to it and I have my things and like all the perks are gone. There's no lounge. There's no this <laughs> line, you know, everything is gone and flying was always annoying and airports are always annoying. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. elevated. It's more annoying than it ever was now. Yeah. I have not been to an airport since, uh, since this all started. Yeah. But well, my point is that I'm not really missing that aspect. Yeah, and I think yeah. a lot of musicians walking away from all this, or like, sorry, walking once the dust settles, let's say, yeah. a lot of people are going to be like, well, you know, some of the shit we were doing before, maybe it's really not that worth it. Maybe we just a way of doing it in a different way. And yeah, no, no, you know, I, I, I've, I've had that same discussion with so many of my friends, you know, I mean, I, I, obviously I gig on a much smaller basis than you do, but we've all kind of come to that same thing as, you know, the, the drive, the loading, the unloading, getting home, yeah. the sun's up. It's like, why am And I got 150 bucks more in my pocket. Why I mean, doing, it's like. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are going to walk away being like, why were we ever doing that? And some of us don't have a choice. We still got to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, but there's ways that we're going to come out of this looking at like certain aspects of gigs. Yeah. And, and a little, say, a little oh, choosier. Be a little choosier and like treat yeah. yourself with a bit more dignity, you know? Like, yeah. You don't yeah. have to do that. I'm a lot more happy spending my friday and saturdays at home doing this when i can actually just get that same yeah, income right. in a different way and, yeah, you know certainly. it's all about evolving and it's all about just being open to different ways of doing the same thing really Sorry. Are you fully set up at home for uh, session work? I am, yeah. Yeah, so that's how you do it. Yeah, it's great, right? In this day and age, everyone is set up yeah. at home. I, I mean, sure, it's great for recording and sending tracks, but for it primarily for me, for writing and for demoing music, that's that's where it's the most. If I if I didn't have anything with me, and I've I've been in this position a lot over the years where I don't have all my stuff with me because I'm living somewhere else or I'm on the road and you have all these ideas, but you can't, all you can do is like iPhone voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of kind of hurts the process. I, I really like to put an idea down when I have it and work on it. Um, it's really important to me. You know, I kind of started this YouTube thing, but uh, you, you were doing a bit of that too uh, earlier on in the, uh, in lockdown. Uh, you started your own YouTube thing uh, called song series. Oh and, yeah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> you gotta it. continue that. It was great. So uh, we're gonna get into all the kind of unique stuff about you with regards to to your playing and your style. You know, I, and I've seen you know a ton of your interviews because um, I really am a fan. Uh, <laughs> but but the the song series YouTube thing. You know, if you're listening to this, check it out because you kind of teach some of your own songs or you teach some of the stuff you kind of jammed on, on uh, Instagram and you kind of show how to play, but, but more importantly, before you kind of show how to play it, you talk about um, the tunings, you know, cause you do a lot of unique tunings. So it, right. it really kind of explains what it is you do. Uh, like for me, it's a, it explained it the clearest um in, in in that youtube series that you did so if i could ask continue it it, it was good <laughs> you, you had good sound and the video was it was great well thanks man i'm, I'm glad yeah. you dug it uh, yeah. i know a lot of people dug it it was uh yeah it was definitely a lockdown idea you know there's yeah. a lot of a lot of folks doing a similar thing and i just sure. do, i do a lot of as you were saying like edu- like stuff on the educational side true fire and right 
uh, jam play, pick up music, like stuff like that. And I, I really enjoy that, but how many more people, how many more people uh, can, I just, I'm just getting sick of hearing myself teach licks or teach about certain scales or this when a million other people are already doing it and are doing it way better. So I just, you know, I have all these song ideas and like you were saying, some of them are recorded and some of them are just yeah, yeah, little just, ideas on Instagram or whatever. Yeah, that's like, cool. That aren't really nothing. And I, I get asked about all the time and some people and a lot of people cover them too. So I was like, you know what, this might be a fun idea to start something up. And, and it was really fun seeing a lot of people do their own take on it. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of, to be honest, life got just really busy. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I started it. I kind of batch recorded the first few and then I, I expected to keep it going pretty consistently. And then stuff just got away. Yeah, from the hey, I, I know these things take a while to edit and you know get, get it ready to go. It's uh, yeah. For those that don't know the video <laughs> editing side, and I was barely <laughs> editing it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. It, it's wild. Yeah, but, but I can tell you did the the audio and the video separately because it was uh, yeah. you know yeah, yeah. it was nice and clear. It wasn't now some guys out there. Um, you know, like Tom Bukovac, who's just, you know, went from zero subscribers to, I don't know where he is now, but he's like a major YouTuber, right? And uh, he just does the the phone in the garage and away he goes. And it, Yeah, man, but like, it's all about honesty. And, and yeah, that's what genuine, it works. Right? And it's, it cannot be more genuine than that, you know? You've been watching that? Um, the, the yeah, I've seen, a, I've seen a bunch of them. Yeah. I've been a, I've been a Tom fan forever. Yeah. <laughs> I think you guys got a lot of similarities, you know, in your approach. Cause I think, I think you guys, both of you don't play guitar. You play music on the guitar. And, uh, cause, cause you know, you're a very lyrical player. You know, lots of guys have said that about you. Um, it's, you're not doing mechanical riffs and just kind of what fits the fingers for the patterns. Right. Most of what you play is something you can kind of walk away humming, right? Can, and 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 Bukovac talked about that a lot on his channels, and uh, actually it was a lesson that that helped me out on a something I was doing with my guys. And I said I you know, played the progression, and then I just started singing a line, and then figured out what the notes were, what I was singing. And I think the two of you guys probably operate a lot like that because it's a lot very. Yeah, musical. I mean, there's a lot of guys and gals that think that way. I mean, yeah. it's like you said, it's the idea of just playing music instead of an instrument. Right. He is just, man, he just, ha he just has the it thing. You know, he, there's a reason he's on a million records. Everything yeah. he plays is the right thing. Yes. And, and he's intense too that, about it. <laughs> what's that? He's intense too, which is killer. Oh man. <laughs> I've, I've been such a fan of him, not only as a follower of his, as his playing and like on sessions that he's been on, but like I've had to learn a bunch of his parts from all like the time playing in the pop country scene. Yeah. yeah I'm I'm countless talk. Bukovac parts. <laughs> That's and great. He's just a fucking man. And it's so <laughs> cool that he's doing the video thing. Because I know it's great. It's so he, helpful. He's totally, it's funny because you've seen him evolve a bit too. Yeah. 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 He yeah. really kind of take on not a persona, but he's got his little, like I, I watched a few near the beginning. I watched a couple like, in the middle and like i've seen a couple recently and it's yeah, yeah. gone from just very casual to still casual to like i got my he's got like a little bit of a gimmick shtick now yeah, yeah that coffee thing just as as the loop is starting that's uh, he just, <laughs> but, he, but he does it but the best part about it is like it's honest and he yeah. he's just doing what he does and he's not doing anything because he thinks anyone wants to hear that he's not doing anything because he thinks it's the right thing it is the right thing, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I totally, I totally get what you're saying. Completely honest, badass guitar playing, yeah, and wise, wise wisdom. Yeah, you know what? It's and, and that's why it's working, right? It's, uh, yeah. I mean, he's got a bit of a name, uh, but he's he's not a household name. You know, he's a studio guy, right? Um, but because it just connected so well, it, it grew, and you know, it really boils down to people do whether you're a musician or you're not, you pick up on amazing talent. Hmm. Talent is definitely there in people that you and I are fans of, but what trumps talent, I think every, like someone like a Bukovac or someone like that, anyone, you know, it's like they, sure. They have some natural talent there, but 
percent or 95 percent of what we're hearing is that 10,000 plus hours that they put oh, in. Well, yeah. Them yeah. sitting on the edge of their bed when they were a kid till they were tw in their 20s till this day, whether it's on their bed or in a garage or in their stu in their office, constantly, endlessly playing. And that's that's what I think is the difference. Yeah, I'm not a believer that you're just gifted and and, and you just do it. You you got to do the you got to you have some gift and and then it's like you said the 10 to 20 to 100,000 hours. Like I think perfect pitch is a gift. Yeah, that's a gift to be yeah, given. That's but like I'm if you're not about. if you don't know how to use it or you don't know why you would take advantage of it or if you you don't care just because you have perfect pitch doesn't make you a great musician. Right. It doesn't right. mean that you're, you know, it just means that you're going to be really annoyed when you're walking down the street hearing out of tune, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. how you use it. It's what you do with it and the time you put in with, with that kind of thing that really excels, makes you, makes you. Anyway, grow. my point is just guys like you or Josh Smith and it's, you're not movie stars and you got good following and and you got the good following because people, whether they're musicians or just music lovers, pick up on what you're doing, you know, and, and they know it's good. Some people may not know why it's good, but they know it's good. And and I think it's great uh, that that's what gains traction, you know, because there's a lot of stuff that becomes super popular that, you know, probably we'd agree shouldn't, but it, it, the system still works. I guess that's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> Yeah. For me, it's funny because I've always been doing videos like long before. Instagram. Yeah, I know. It's great. When you, when YouTube was like kind of just YouTube and it wasn't the most popular thing, I was putting up videos of me playing at sock, like, but I was doing it all, I, whether it was from a gig or yeah, it's good for trying an idea. So when people started posting videos of them playing on Instagram and stuff, I was kind of in my head, like, well, yeah, fine. Like, welcome to the, <laughs> isn't this how it's been? And to me, it was like that. I was already in that mindset. So it wasn't yeah. anything new. Yeah. And you do it really honest. You're just, you know, uh, sitting on a chair with your guitar and, and you, you turn your phone on, you know, so it's, it's, it's honest. There's no, there's no gimmicks. There's no overdubbing. There's no magic going on. It, it, it's just you playing. Well, that's, that's my network. That's like my version of the Oprah channel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you want to see what I do? Come to a show. Yeah, yeah. Check out my music. Uh, in the meantime, here, here's a little, here's a little bit of guitar, and it's honest, like I was saying. It's just, yeah, no, that's. Uh, I'm not going to sit there uh, just playing stuff that people want to hear or cover stuff that people want to hear. I'm just going to do my thing, and uh, like I'm not an Instagram guitar player. I yeah, yeah, no, I no. Use Instagram; yeah. it's a great platform yeah, for what yeah, I do. Yeah, we were talking about the song series, and I was mentioning. That for me, that's really how the dots connected to what you, how you tune and how you set up your guitar. Uh, you know, there's lots of other stuff I want to talk about, but let's just jump into that because that's what you know clearly is has has made you a, a unique player. You know, one of your favorite tunings is uh, tuned to a standard B. You still form all the chords the same way, but you know your top notes a B. So you've lowered the damn thing considerably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tuned down a fourth, so it's just baritone. Yeah, yeah. If you pick up a baritone at a shop, and it sounds like it does. That's it's just the same tuning uh, in fourths. Yeah, but yeah, but down a fourth. Yeah, and yeah, sounds a lot yeah, lower. And, and it just sounds killer. Like it's like, uh, and, and you've discussed this before that it's it's different. Even though the tuning is baritone. Because it's the same scale as it's a normal guitar scale, whatever twenty five and a half if you're a yeah. Fender guy. Uh, that that it's got a different sound than a baritone guitar, right? Yeah, I mean, like even just acoustically, I have it right here. Like it just it just sings. Can you hear yeah. that? I can hear it. It's it's killer. <laughs> anyway, it's it's it just. Like you said, and I've said many times, it's just different. Yeah. Different is the key word. 
Um, but it doesn't do everything, you know? It, I find, yeah. especially lately, so many times going back, well, not, it's not like going back, like I haven't been playing standard tuning. I play standard tuning all the time, but it's all about different colors and voices, right? Yeah. So for my show, yeah, I use that a lot, and I use an open strung guitar a lot. Right, yeah, you do a lot of open. Um, but variety is the spice of life and in music and for guitar playing for me i get inspired by switching it up so if i yeah. if i'm staying on one thing for too long and like in this like a tuning per se yeah yeah i'll find myself not falling into like a rut or anything like that but i just find a lot i'll just be doing a lot of the same so yeah. switching up the tunings keeps it fresh for me and hopefully keeps it fresh for what well, it's a real unique there. sound you know and i know you told this story a bunch of times but uh you know that that kind of came came in for you and, and that guitar that you just picked up for us uh the mule uh caster stratocaster what do you call it well it's technically called a posing caster but po it, Ooh. It's definitely <laughs> no it's called a like a strato mule a strato mule okay right yeah, i don't think so, there's any been it hasn't been like a trademark name or anything but it, it goes by a few different names so it, it's a cool story how how that came to be uh you know on, on your on your first album you did um which is you know there's a lot of guitar on it um every song's got a solo but it's not a guitar shredding album but you did kind of let uh -huh. go you let go on one tune uh get you back and you tell the story that uh, it was a uh, Tiesco Del Rey cheap little thing with gold foils. You couldn't tour with it. And then this filled the, the void. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I love that guitar, that Tiesco Del Rey, the very special guitar. I bought it at a pawn shop in Goshen, Indiana, playing, playing the ignition garage with the brothers Landreth like five years ago or yeah. five years ago. Okay. Or, you know, like I paid 50 think? bucks for it, yeah. you know? It's so people that know their Tesco's and, and those kind of sixties Japanese guitars, they're all kind of crappy. Yeah. They yeah. all have that magic and there's like a certain something within each one. And yeah, that thing has one pickup, yeah. super microphonic. You can't, you can't really play it live unless yeah, you're yeah. playing the quietest gig of your life. <laughs> so on get you back, uh, it was amazing. It's actually, it's such a great recording guitar, but you know, you, you can be sitting there. You can, if you're in the control room and you're like running your amp hot in another room, the thing was feeding back just off the studio monitors itself. <laughs> and that's why in that that's solo crazy. on that song, once I kick the fuzz on, you can hear it feedback and you can hear me hitting the guitar itself. And it was just reacting and doing all these things. It's just any other properly, I don't, maybe I shouldn't say properly made, but you know, like a strap or a Les Paul or a 335 or a Charlie, they just wouldn't do that. Have you ever checked out uh, the Eastwood guitars? Because they, they kind of model all their stuff off those kind of wacky 60s uh, uh, cheap Eastwood guitars. Eastwood or Eastman? Oh. Eastman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it like Eastman? Doing okay. like the 335s and stuff like that? Yeah, like, but they do like a Tiesco and, and all those kind of guitars. And, oh. the, the, you know, the Maserite the, the, with the, the plastic. Yeah. 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 Like they, so they take those, I don't know how they did it business wise. They got the rights to it, but they rebuild those guitars and they just put it up to today's standards. Right. Check yeah, them out. Um, yeah. The Eastmans that I have checked out are really nice, actually. Yeah, They're yeah. Really yeah. nice guitars. You know, we mentioned the, the B. Uh, the B standard, and then of course you do a lot of open tuning. Yeah, um, and you've discussed that it's a one, you know, a one five one three five one, and uh, you know, depending on you know the key you want to play in, that's that's kind of where you are. But in some of your conversations, and I know you do a lot of interviews, so I, I kind of feel bad asking questions. Research. Love it. <laughs> He said, you've done your research. Oh, well, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. I told you I was a fan. Um, <laughs> so anyway, th this part's really cool because uh, you try to match the tuning to the string gauge. So a lot of guys, we just, oh, we got to, you know, we got to play in C and, you know, and then you're just flopping around. It's not working. So you kind of set your string gauges to the open tuning to have that you know, to maintain a consistent feeling, right? So it's not something you just, 
whip on a set of a set of strings. I mean, you gotta you gotta play with the nut and you gotta play with the action because you got different games. So, talk a little bit about that because I know you've you've mentioned that and I find it pretty fascinating. Yeah, it really, it really requires a, a lot of setup, and that's something I've just been doing it a long time now to, to know that you can't just put any you can't just put any gauge of strings on and tune down like the, the guitar is set up for one thing and mm-hmm. you start messing with that it starts to get really confused and doesn't act right because it's not set up for certain things like that so uh, it just takes me back to when i was younger and and listening to to some guys when i was younger and being like oh it sounds so good and i was you know using tens on a strat with a floating bridge and tuning down to like open C sharp or something like that. And yeah, it, yeah, you can't. it sounded horrible and it wouldn't work. And yeah. I just played it anyways and tried to make it work Yeah, because it was so cool. And then yeah, in time it's like, Oh, of course, like tune down lower. It's gotta, you just, ha- you just strengthen it up. Have your, have your strength, yeah. it up. And yeah. yeah, everyone that plays, you grab a baritone off at a store, like it'll be 14s or 15s to yeah. whatever, 60 something. It's the same what I'm doing. And it's like, there's nothing. When you think about it, it's not crazy. What's crazy? No, no, is- it's, it's not. Once I finally kind of understood what you're doing, it's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Really, all I got to do is just get the guy to file, uh, you know, kind of the bass strings on, uh, on you know, probably the, the E, A, and the D a little wider. Yeah, your third string is also... Uh, yeah is round is, is it wound oh, at the, so uh, okay your third fourth fifth and sixth strings will need some just a slightly wider nut wow so yeah. when you're when you're not playing slide and you're soloing you're you're uh you're bending on a wound uh, g-string yeah oh, that's cool but again but again it's like it's, it's the right tension i guess right it's the right tension so um works. any guitar of mine whatever the tuning is it's it's set up so that I can play slide comfortably and then yeah. I can play uh, without a slide comfortably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. the most important thing. That, that's cool. Uh, and it has to be a place where you don't even think about it. You know what I mean? It, it, it's like a subconscious. I saw you um, at, at Dakota's in Toronto. I can't remember. I think you only had three guitars with you. So when you do a gig, you know, you've got your 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 B standard. And what, what open keys are you? do you have guitars set to? Um, uh, I, yeah, uh, I probably only have two guitars, but I, I, I'll do the, the B standard and yeah. I'll do a guitar in open C okay. and the, the reason I will bring an open C instead of an open D or an open E guitar is that, you know, you can capo up. So yeah, yeah I've seen you do that. A lot of my yeah. songs are in G or in C or in F. So okay. it makes sense to have that lower real estate. Yeah, yeah, sure. But, you know, if I'm playing a song like How Long or Can't Stop Thinking About You or a bunch of other songs in my set, you know, that's that's all an open D. So yeah. I, I capo the second fret. You know, if there's other songs, play an E, open E. It's just rather than if I was an open E, it sounds amazing just on yeah open. But when I can't travel with five or six guitars. Yeah, yeah, no, I was wondering it's that. Yeah. About efficiency. Okay, so you go with C and then you use the capo. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then, uh, so for, for people just to get a, an idea, other guitar players to get an idea here when your, your B guitar, and I've heard you mention this, uh, you're using a, you know, a 17 to 64 set. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, and are these all custom sets or is this something I could go to Long and McQuaid and pick up? It's uh, I guess it's a custom set. It's through string joy who are good friends okay. of mine. They're out of Nashville and I've been working where well, I, I don't say working, but I've been, you know, using their stuff for five years or so coming up on six years and they're just great. They're, they're open to trying different things out and really keen on custom sets. And if you gave me something with lighter strings and it still felt good, I, I don't care. Like that's what yeah, I'll yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, But Scott, who's the head honcho there, he suggested those gauges. He, he yeah. thought it'd be, and i think it took us a couple tries i think we started maybe what was maybe like 16 to 64 or 7 i don't don't remember it there was some very specific gauges and (laughs) he he was kind of suggesting it and i tried it and go ah so close can we just make the second string just like one or two heavier and yeah, that's how it kind of came about. That's cool. No, I, I feel very motivated to try it. I'm going to try it because uh, 
I don't maybe a month, maybe two months ago, I interviewed Jason Barry, and uh, I've oh, had yeah. a I've had a B bender for a long time, mm. but uh, I, I didn't really play it. And then after I interviewed him, that's all I've been playing. That's the guitar. The guitar on my couch is my B bender. You and, got a uh, like a strap one? Yeah, I I got a real heavy one. I got the early '90s Fender that has the Parsons, so it's the solid. That's when they made it with solid steel, so the thing weighs a lot. Oh Actually, yeah, and I've been I've been having a sore shoulder for a while, <laughs> so they, I I got to get one uh, that's the newer the some of the newer guys like Forrest Lee or you know that they, they kind of make them out of uh, 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 lighter alloys. Yeah, know? Barry's um, keeping the the uh, the Bender. He's he's bender got the same one I got. Yeah, he's got the Parsons. He's got the heavy one. I had a Bender and a Telly once. Well, I guess why did I say a Telly? What else are you going to put it in? <laughs> and it was fun, but. I, because it's not really my thing and i didn't yeah, yeah i can't see you playing on <laughs> it was just a novelty and it was this was at a time when i was playing a lot of country music oh that's true yeah I back then I, you probably could have done it but it yeah. was uh it it was like a novelty to me yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't part of an arsenal for me that it was it was useful in a way where i, I could actually make use out of it other than just doing it to do it do you know what yeah. i mean yeah but it's cool inside of a chord. It's cool to oh, it's, play it's chords. And, yeah, it's it's it's, it's fun. Yeah, Trust it's me, fun. It's, I'm. It's a gorgeous thing when it's played right. Oh my! Yeah, yeah, God. yeah. But I, sure. I wasn't doing it justice. I was just. <laughs> and then you mess yourself up. You do you do your your standard country licks where you you know you're kind of bending up, and then you do it too. So you've now you and now you've you gone up two tones. <laughs> you know uh, the singer that I that I play with. He just wrote this beautiful kind of ballad. Uh, and I'm, I was just thinking, like, I gotta try what uh, what Ariel does, and I think it would work really cool. So I don't know. I, I don't know with COVID if my guy at uh, Cosmo, if, if you can just go in there and he can, you know, widen a couple uh, the slots. Oh, I'm for sure me he. Not, but, I'm sure they are. I'm yeah, sure. I'll, I'll find out. Everybody's got new rules now, right? You know, right. you got you got to disinfect the guitar for 14 days or some crap like that. I, yeah. I yeah, my guy was the place he works out of. They were quarantining guitars. Yeah, quarantine. For a few days. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I encourage you to do it though. Again, it's not like I gotta try it. Yeah, it it doesn't. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Like you said, it's 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 a <laughs> it's a regular scale, but you got your baritone thing. So you know, for guys like uh, if you're fretting like your your standard cowboy A chord, that's that's an E now, right? So okay. it's it's just. Just making sure you know which key you're in. That's all. <laughs> but a transposing never hurt anybody. Yeah, exactly. So in there. we we touched on the tuning and uh, the slide playing is huge in uh, in what you do. You know, you've kind of got a style. I mean, you're not the only one doing it, but you do some uh, fretting behind behind the slide and and you're playing single note stuff and adding the slide and it's it's beautiful, man. Like it's it's so <laughs> musical. Um, but it's cool. I've seen in an interview that out of all the amazing, you know, Lowell, Lowell George or all the amazing slide players out there, your major influence was a local Toronto guy, uh, uh, Kevin Bright. So yes. the part I don't I really understand, is when did that happen for you? Like kind of what age did that happen for you and, and how? Okay. Well, since this is, uh, I know you've had a lot of Ontario or former Ontario based guitar players. Yeah, on. yeah, exactly. So, so. <laughs> so first of all, yeah, I think I first heard Kevin maybe 2006 or 2007. Okay. In fact, no, I heard him in 2004 at the Vancouver Folk Fest. And I was just there. I was just had just graduated high school. And my uncle who lives there just brought me out as like a grad gift. He said, come hang out in Vancouver. And I went out and we went to the Folk Fest for a day. And I didn't know it at the time, but... It was Kevin Bright, like, just doing a workshop. I, I don't know if it was Sisters Euclid or, or who he was there with, but there was this guy playing guitar that, like, there was some, there was like some charisma and character about it that I didn't catch his name, but like mm -hmm. that stuck with me forever. And then two years later, uh, I stumbled upon Sisters Euclid. A lot of people, like all my friends who, like my circle of musical friends, 
there was a bunch of fans and artists that we were all listening to. And one of them was the sisters Euclid started listening to it. And it was like, okay, this is pretty incredible. And then I started digging deeper into Kevin's repertoire and I noticed all his solo material. And then I got into all his stuff with Harry Manx. And then of course I got into all his stuff just as a session player, Katie Lang, Nora Jones, Cassandra Wilson. So, so on and so forth. So much good stuff. Um, I've seen Derek trucks many times, you know, I've seen Sonny Landreth. I've seen Ry Cooter a bunch of times. I've seen like, I've seen Bonnie Ray. I've opened, you know, it's just like, it's all amazing, like moving, but his style of playing, which I know has been influenced by the likes of Lowell George and all these other people, right. something about his voice and his take on slide guitar and just guitar playing in general. Yeah, yeah. I was very inspired by his versatility, like playing mandolin and banjo and, Resonator, all that stuff too. That's yeah, a whole. Yeah, other. yeah, sure. But the slide playing just spoke to me. It just really grabbed struck me eh? cool. And you know that he's the reason I started messing around in open tuning. But when I okay. finally thought I got it, like a grip of what he was doing, and not actually like, getting a grip, but just hearing in my head, like I think like a lot of things that he's doing has to be in opening or like an yeah, open yeah. tuning. It made me take a guitar, put it to open E, and I just started figuring shit out. I was yeah, just, I was taking open E guitar on gigs. Yeah, I heard you say that. That's so. And cool. I would try it. I would. It'd be a lot of trial by fire. It'd be a lot of times where I'd be getting a lot of work like this. Do you know how to play this song? And I'd be like, I do, but I'm trying to do it basically on the new instrument. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but doing that over time. Yeah, you must. Me think uh more music based and less guitar based because you have you couldn't depend on certain familiarity yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? that's cool man that's that was a ballsy move but shit that's kind of like jump in and swim you know <laughs> well for me the way i work on things i need to do it in context and i need to apply it not under pressure but in the environment that i want to be using it in. using it live or using it on a gig like that's for me, that's how it's got to be. It's got to be yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. thinking, thinking about it while I'm doing it, like, and then eventually the getting spot. to a point where I don't have to think about it, and it just yeah. it just happens. And I just oh, you're right. it never ends. But you're right. You probably really fast tracked yourself because if you were like a normal person who would like just do it, you know, in their room until they thought they were good enough to do it on stage, it would have taken you a lot longer. Yeah, I'd still say I'm like I'm definitely more comfortable in standard tuning than, than open. I'm not like oh okay, yeah. I'm not fifty fifty. I think I'd say I'm like sixty forty. Huh. Well, you're pretty convincing. Um, you've also got your own signature slide, so that's kind of cool. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the first times I I saw you, you know, kind of on Instagram or wherever it was, I think it was really somebody forwarding an Instagram to one of those guitar Facebook channels. I'm older, so I'm a, you know, Facebook, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but yeah, you had this kind of cool slide and, uh, I mean, I'm sure somebody had it before you, but, uh, it's got this ball tip on it and it, it's pretty unique, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't see the end, but what's, so what's the advantage of that? Is it just that you can kind of curl up on it and still get Is that going to work? Oh yeah. 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 Dark, but, Auto focus yeah, yeah. for the let's, let's, let's just confirm with everybody that that was a slide. <laughs> yeah, or was it? Uh, no, the uh, the story with the slide is that I've been using Rock Slide since 2012. I want to say. Okay. Great stuff. Really nice. And I I went years and years and years and years of playing guitar as a sideman, playing slide, struggling because I would just have. Slides that I didn't realize were just the wrong fit. I would grab the first thing off the wall and I didn't know anything about string action or about string gauge and slice <laughs> slide size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was always struggling, but always kind of making it work, I guess, in some weird way. And once I met Danny at the rock slide, it kind of opened my eyes to like, oh, it should just fit properly. Cool. Okay. And we built a relationship and through the band, we'd always stay at his house when we would tour the West coast. Like if we were in Vancouver yeah, yeah. or playing Seattle, Portland, we'd stay at his place in Spokane. And every time we go there, he opened, he'd open up one room where there's all the slides basically. And take, take whatever you want, man, try some stuff out. And 
I, I really took a liking to the smaller size pinky, pinky slide. And he had these ball tipped ones and I thought they kind of looked really funny. And yeah, yeah. he said, try it out. And it felt really good. I kind of connected with it immediately. The ball tip really doesn't do anything. It's not there. Okay. To, like it doesn't actually help. It may just smoothen out the bottom <laughs> strings a little bit, but to be honest, it's not, it's no crutch. Like it's not helping anything out. If you can't oh, play okay. slide and you grab that, you probably still won't be able to play. Slide. <laughs> okay. So uh, you're, you're not trying to use the tip or anything. No, you, you, okay. you just can't. However, though, if you, if you were to dead on, like go on the string with it, rather than getting that kind of ugly piercing sound that you would get from the scraping of the string, yeah, yeah, yeah. you just don't get that. Yeah, that, yeah. that would be the advantage. Okay. So, all right. So, so, so it's nothing too magical then. It's nothing too magical, but yeah. it is comfortable. It does fit your finger like a glove, which is yeah, the idea. Yeah. Maybe and it does something for the weight too, since the top is closed. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, it is. Yeah, there's a bit of weight to it, but not yeah. too much. It, it just yeah. feels comfortable, and, and a lot of people really dig it, which cool. is awesome. And yeah. you know, I've seen people use it on different fingers. That's great. The yeah. fact that it just connects with people and helps them get into slide, I, that makes me super happy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but. At the end of the day, uh, for me, that's I need that. I need that slide. It, it's it's what helps me do my job. So so is the the fretting behind the slide thing? Is that is that kind of something that you got from Sonny Landreth, or or how did you get? Uh, and there's no relation between the uh, Landreth brothers and Sonny Landreth. No, there isn't. There isn't. <laughs> let's just let's just get that straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no there's no relation there. Yeah. Um, I was actually never a big Sonny fan. In fact, so I, where did you pick up the the fretting behind the slide from? That's the only guy I know who did it. So, I, well, first of all, Mister Mister Bright was the first guy. Okay, cool. He plays on his ring finger, but have, like, have you listened to Faith Cola? Have you heard that song? No, no I'm gonna check it out though. You yeah, listen to Faith Cola, and that was basically the first thing I heard. Well, if that was the first thing I heard, then that was like 2007. That doesn't make sense. Anyways, um, yeah, Kevin always doing the behind the slide stuff that uh, cool. pedal steel harp type of stuff uh, so cool. it, it all comes it, it all comes from him it's, excellent that, well, that that's was great. The first time I heard it. yeah that first album how long you had uh uh ryan and um ryan voth and uh david landreth and yeah. uh, alex campbell played on that so which was pretty well brothers landreth Mine right i guess so yeah. <laughs> also also, just my friends that I've been playing music with, yeah, for almost twenty years. So I mean, long before that. Are they on the new uh, the new stuff? They are not. Oh, okay, cool. So trying out um, some different different players. Different players. I, I I yeah, I wanted to spice it up and change it up. I had a really awesome rhythm section actually. I had well, my bass player who plays with me all the time is Mr. Julian Bradford, who's also from Winnipeg. Okay. Also, have been playing music with him for 15 years at least just it's all about history right it's all yeah, about yeah. i mean you could be the best player in the world but if you don't really have that history and kind of get each other music doesn't come across as much which is interesting because the dr who's playing drums is jj johnson so if you're not familiar with jj i mean i first heard him on the early doyle bram hall records oh shit really he played in john okay. mayer's band oh boy. like where the light is all that stuff and and he's been in the in Tedeschi trucks for the last ten years. Oh, okay. I, I don't know the name, you, but I know everything you just said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you if you just look up any of the things I just said, yeah, and you realize, oh, I've seen this before. Yeah, oh, that's who JJ is. Yeah, yeah. I've just been a big fan of him forever, and he came out with a mutual friend to a show that's mine cool. in Nashville last that's year. Cool. Yeah, and we, yeah, I was chatting with my pal, and I wanted to have a different band. I wanted to spice it up. And I kind of yeah. had a list of my like some of my favorite drummers, and and he said, "Why don't you just ask JJ?" I said, "You think he'd do it?" And he said, "For sure." That's and awesome. Sure enough, uh, I he finished a gig in Boston in December, flew him to Winnipeg. I said, "Make sure you bring a winter jacket." <laughs> what what month was this when he flew in? December. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. I and where's he from? Like originally from? He's from Austin. Oh, shit. Or I, he lives in Austin. <laughs> yeah, that's a little he, different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was such a great experience, man. He's become a great friend. Oh, good for you. Uh, we were, yeah. But what he brought to these songs and his 
was everything I could have hoped for and more. It's just, it was a learning experience having it. Oh, great. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the music. That's great. No, that's right. cool. You know, that you, you kind of got different musicians. That's, that's going to add and, 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 and make things a, a little bit more unique, right? I mean, no, there's something to be said about having uh, a, a, like a regular team to do stuff. Like, that's sure. what a band is all about, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But when you have the luxury of just switching it up and, and getting inspired with new people and evolving, that's almost more exciting to me. Sure. And I like to hear that personally and with my favorite artists and bands too. Yeah. Because yeah, they're going to yeah. still sound like them, they're still going to do their thing. But you get all the elements that they're yeah. bringing in from other people and other influence. Sometimes it doesn't work, but when it works, which it usually does work, it's pretty magical. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I saw you at uh, Dakota, I guess you were just, when you came back, I guess, from, from Ireland or wherever you were coming from. Um, well, I was just on you, tour in Canada, but I, yeah, I just had a pickup then. That wasn't my Yeah, day. but it was cool. I mean, you had, you know, we'll get, we're going to get into Canadian country scene, but your, uh, your backup band was Gary Craig and John Diamond, who's been on thousands of records. And uh, that was a killer night. I mean, that, that was uh, a fun night, man. That was great. Yeah, I don't. You remember that gig? I mean, you played a lot of gigs. That was my first. I mean, I've played in Toronto hundreds of times. It feels like, but that was my first show as a solo artist in Toronto. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And yeah, I... to be sold out at the Dakota. I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. That was a great gig. I I <laughs> I, I got some videos from that night. Yeah, that was a special uh, night. That was a fun, fun yeah. night. John yeah. and Gary. I've known John. For yeah, you probably time. played with him before many times. I, I played I with John, yeah, yeah. And we even we actually just did a, a recording session right before I did my this this new record. Oh, uh, cool! I good love that. You. It's always good to work with him. And and yeah. Gary, such a beautiful, yeah, yeah, solid. Um, oh, yeah, we had yeah, never yeah. played played with each other. That was our first time. I because I, I talked. I remember talking to John at the bar before before you guys guys got going. And uh, yeah, he said uh, you had a rehearsal. I guess the day before, and uh, away you go. And it was, it was a great night. So it was kind of funny because uh, I got there quite early because I uh, I wanted to make sure I had a de decent seat, which was pointless anyway because everybody was standing on the dance floor. So it's very know. Facebook of you, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very yeah. I was showing my age. So anyway, I get there and um, sitting at the first table, and um, your uncle and aunt uh, come in. I didn't know them, but anyway, they uh, they asked, you know, can we sit here? And we started yeah, yeah. talking. So so yeah, I got to meet some of your uh, your family that night, and uh, and it was funny, right? Because uh, you know. Younger people kind of come closer to when the show starts, not like uh, old farts like me. So, um, <laughs> so, so we're sitting there, you know, talking. Yeah, all right, that's great. And uh, then the place just jams up, and you know, I'll stand. I'm not as old as your uncle and aunt. <laughs> and uh, they they were sitting and uh, couldn't see shit. And uh, I I was looking at them and I could see like they were like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turned into so a party rock show pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, but it was uh, that was a great that was a great show. I really, I really enjoyed it. And uh, you know, you did a lot of your uh, a lot of the stuff off the album, and then you did some really cool covers, the Billy Preston tune, uh, something from nothing, or nothing, nothing from nothing. Yeah. close <laughs> were you were you at the horse horseshoe no i i for some reason i couldn't make that one i did want to oh, do that okay. one and uh, uh that might have been better <laughs> no it, it, i mean that was i mean that was a toronto is a special city man especially when you're not from it um i think i think of the the the, the dakota and the horse and the shoe is like these legendary for like to even you know to, to bring if you could bring 10 people down to one of those places let alone <laughs> Um, a few hundred or something. It's like, yeah, oh, no, you got a good following, man. It's, it's crazy. Uh, anyway, on that, you know, you, you, you started touring that album and, um, you know, in another interview, <laughs> repeating stuff, but it, you're the same guy. So what am I supposed to do? Um, <laughs> you know, but this happens to all of us. You, you do a recording. It's fresh because you just yeah. kind of wrote it. And uh, then you go gig for a year, a year and a half. And you know you're 
you're adding some new stuff to it, you know, because you're playing it, you know, you played the song a hundred times. Um, so then instead of just coming out with new songs, you did this really cool thing you called Familiar Ground. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about that, uh, that brings us back to Winnipeg. You, you did it in the studio, you recorded, had some friends, did a video, and you pretty well played the album again, but after playing it on the road for a hundred times. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Well, you basically just said it there, my friend. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> basically, no, no. Yeah, Familiar Ground, like you said, you put out a record, you write a record, you write the songs, you record them, you yeah. know, maybe eight to ten months later, you finally release the album. That's over a year of it, like, once it was first contested, yeah, yeah. right? So once you start playing it, you're already kind of you've performed them so many more times that yeah, it's crazy. Eh? It's not even that mu- those specific songs have evolved that much, but I definitely like they, they shape the, a slightly different form and they got a bit yeah. more comfy. It's really yeah. just, they got more comfortable. That's it. Yeah. That's a good word. And so the, yeah, the idea with familiar ground was just one last kick at the can of that album cycle because I was touring again yeah. last fall into basically I was touring October till March 7th of this year. Yeah. yeah. Right before COVID started in North America. So that was all under the, the umbrella of familiar ground. And, you know, I, I, I've already been playing songs from the new, from this upcoming record, but it was like the last hurrah. And so it's called familiar ground because the songs are familiar. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Last year. Yeah. It makes sense. And to me. the studio is familiar because I recorded the album there, but also it's familiar ground because I grew up in that studio. That's where my parents yeah, yeah, recorded yeah. all their records. That's great. So I spent my childhood there climbing the carpeted walls and watching <laughs> Boy Meets World on a TV there while That's they were great. tracking. That's great. And then also the people that, that were in the, uh, in the audience were all friends and family. So it's like there was familiarity too. So it, it was just kind of the common theme for it. Yeah, I was going to ask that. So everybody, yeah, that's what it was. It was it was family and friends, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's cool. You know that that's a, that's a it's a great idea because uh, you know just on a smaller scale for myself, I know like I, you kind of get ah, I wish I kind of recorded it this way here. I wish you know, and then you're kind of like, well, shit. I'm just going to take these cooler ideas and kind of redo it in a different sort of situation. And uh, people can enjoy it differently. It's, it's yeah, a great I, idea. Thanks, man. But I, I got to say, if it wasn't for Paul and Jen who run the studio, yeah, you know, they went out of their way to set the whole. That, that's the live room. That's where you know we'll put. It's a good size room. It's a nice room. It, it's a lot bigger looking on on oh, video. Is it? Than it really? Oh, okay. Is. Okay. But, you know, we we I, we had to rent all these chairs. We had to rent 30 <laughs> headphones. Oh, good for you, man. We had to rent all these extra pieces of gear to facilitate that, right? Yeah. Because everyone that's listening on headphones. Right, because it's a try. All they would hear is the drums if they didn't have headphones on. Exactly. You're right. So, I, ne- I never thought of that. So I'm running three amps, but they're yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, in a closet. Here. Right, yeah. None of them had to, yeah, cabinets in another, in the studio B room. Yeah, yeah. And then the bass is direct. We're all singing live, but we're all on in ears. Yeah, the only yeah. thing you hear is drums. Yeah. But everyone on the headphones, they're hearing a mix that Paul right. has done up for them in, from oh. the control room, and they're all on a cue mix. It was Shit. a crazy setup. Really don't matter if you never pull. Oh, it really don't matter if you take two. Really don't matter if you leave me home. Oh, Angeline, did you hear Wow, I and, never thought of that. You're right. That's a lot of work. And other than the audio, which was the biggest thing, and like the studio and like the setup in the room, uh, the B and B studio, like the video guys, Jan and Buyo and Quincy, they we had to go back and forth a few times just to figure out what would be the best way, best way to light that room yeah, yeah. and get the angles that it was just getting a little bit of everything. Everyone basically killed it. I'm, I'm pretty awesome. proud of how that turned out. I'll I throw think. a clip in because it, it is really cool. Thanks, yeah. man. Um, yeah. It was just a good, it was just a good way to send off those songs in that yeah. album. It's a brilliant it like, idea. It like a full circle kind of moment. Was the so, idea. Uh, so that segues into your, uh, your kind of your upbringing. So you said this is uh it was a studio. What's the name of the studio? 
It's called stereo bus recording now, but it used to be called channels. That oh, was okay, cool. cool. Yeah. So yeah, you said that's kind of where your, your parents did a lot of recording. Yeah, I kind of looked that up. Uh, your parents have a band uh, called Finjan. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of a world music uh, klezmer band. And yeah. uh, these guys know what they're doing. I was kind of looking it up and it was like there was a gig they did. I guess it's like four years now, but they did it with the Winnipeg uh, Symphony Orchestra. So it's kind of cool. Like your uh, your parents kind of took kind of klezmer music and took it up a couple notches, I guess. Eh? Yeah, I mean, they, they would do klezmer music, but it was also... There'd be jazz, there'd be folk, there'd be... Well, that's oh, like part they, of it, right? Like they would go to a folk fest and, you know, in a workshop, the band could hang in any kind of situation. So to speak. Oh, but those, guys, those guys are great musicians. Like, the, if they're playing... Like, the guys who play klezmer can play jazz. I mean, it's not like you totally. can't... Yeah. Totally. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty intense... Hey, have you ever seen the movie uh, The Gig? I have not, no. Oh, okay. All right, well... You're going to love the premise of this thing. And it, 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 I don't know, maybe your parents have seen it. And if they haven't, I don't know, find it and watch it with them. So the premise is six amateur musicians. They, uh, they get a gig uh, out in the Catskills. And, and they kind of do jazz and klezmer. And um, the, uh, their bass player uh, f- fell ill. So they had to get a, a, a professional bass player. Anyway, so the whole movie is they're out in the Catskills. And, you know, there's some comedy, but there, it's it's kind of serious in a sense because it's really about just conflicting. Like some guys just have the dreams of wanting to be a full-time musician. And then you got the real guy who's, you know, doesn't have a day job and he's the real musician. And then you've got one of the one of the amateur guys that's good enough to be pro. And then you got a guy who's the clarinet player who wants to be pro, but he's not good enough. You know, right. it's, it's, it's an incredible movie. And because it's got this whole... The band was kind of a mix of Dixie Jazz, Klezmer, this kind of stuff in the Catskills. I mean, I think you, you and your parents would have a hoot watching this. Cool. The gig. So, I'll check it out. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Hopefully it's it's somewhere you can find it. You know, the, your parents were, uh, you know, professionals by the day and then kind of gig it on the weekends. And then the summer, uh, they would do, like you said, all the festivals. And that's so you music's been in you since I've heard you say since you were like a little baby, you know, you were yeah. taken out on the road. Totally. I, I was on my first flight when I was, I think a month and a half <laughs> to, to go great. to a gig <laughs> that I was not playing. So like, uh, like a lot of us, I think we, before we got to guitar, we, we started on piano, right? Get, get the parents kind of send you for piano lessons to get the fundamentals. So yeah. how long were you, uh, how long were you playing the piano kind of before you, you switched to the guitar? I don't think I, I'm not even sure that I, I made a year. Um, I was around seven, seven years old. And it wasn't even that we were stuck playing piano. Like my mom's a piano player and, you know, we grew up with music in the house all the time. So we'd always yeah. kind of just like, yeah, 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 not know what we were doing on the piano. So she just signed us up for lessons and it, it was fun. Like I, I really did enjoy it, but I always just had this lust for the guitar. Oh, that's cool. And she could see that. So when finally, when I was just, can I just stop doing these and could we do guitar lessons? She was like, <laughs> yeah, of course. Excellent. That piano upbringing helped me, sh- like, shape me for who I am, just in terms of it helped me, you know, read music. Yeah, yeah. It taught me how to just understand simple harmony and chord structure. Yeah, yeah. Being yeah. music in a certain way that isn't just guitar related. Piano should be mandatory. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, it's just right there in front of you, you know, and it's like, yeah. you know, it's great. You're... Such a great tool for me, at least to like jump on a piano and be like, Oh yeah. Right. Because I'm not, I'm not in any way proficient on it. I, I yeah. know what the music side should be. I can hear and I can visualize like, yeah, I, I want these notes and in the, in these chords and I want it to be shaped like this. I know, like I just know what needs to go into it, but it takes me, so much longer just to find it the right way but it forces me to play a lot more simple and it's it's a really great thing like i've been like i was saying i'm producing a couple records at the moment and i was playing some piano on them and (laughs) again i don't i don't tell people i'm a piano player because i'm not really oh that's cool but i i I can do very simple and more more padding like background kind of cording kind of yeah like i don't have i don't have the feel i don't i'm not like a I don't have the thing, but I can, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can keep it really simple and 
serve a song in a right way when it need, when it can call for it. Oh, cool that you're still Very doing simple, it though. But yeah. it's so satisfying to me because it's just sometimes it, it inflicts such more mo- like emotions and stuff than I, I would get from guitar. It's almost like when you have too many tricks in the bag or too many options to say the same thing in many ways, you sign, you sometimes lose sight of what's most important. And I go on the piano and it's just it's honest and it's pure. Yeah, yeah. Simple as hell. Like it's nothing complicated. Well, you, and you play differently, right? Because on piano, it's, it, yeah. it, it's so much easier to, um, you know, change your bass, your bass notes over your chords, right? So yeah. that you get this whole, whole new sonic thing going. It's uh, yeah, yeah. It's kind of funny. I, I, I mean, I, I don't really play much piano, uh, but I did at one point a bit. So I kind of, I, I know physically what I'm supposed to do, but now on YouTube, you know, there's some great channels that will show you. Like I remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had decided, you know, I want to learn how to play Saturday in the park, you know, da, 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 you know, and it's like, they show you right on YouTube what to Hell do. Yeah. And it's like, ah, fuck, that's not, that. it's not that hard. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Anyway. So, you know, you kind of grew up in a little different era than I did. It wasn't, wasn't really guitar heroes that got you going. You were, you were kind of growing up as with the with the grunge music. So it was like guitar bass, but not guitar music, right? Totally. So uh, so that's kind of what got you going, which is really totally outside of what you are now. So that's that's kind of cool. Yeah, well, it was the Beatles. Like we were when once I started playing guitar, it was the same year when the Beatles anthology came out. Oh, okay. And my parents both grew up. You know, yeah, sure. during like, Beatlemania sure. and all, like they grew up Beatles fans. Yeah, and so once that was on TV, they're like, "Guys, you know, my brother and I, like, you, you have to watch this. Like, <laughs> you kind of don't have a choice." And we loved it. Like, it was in the blood. It was in the genes. Like, we just we were completely taken by it. We loved loved it, and that was very influential. But yeah, at, the, at that same time, it was. It was Green Day, Nirvana. It was Rage Against the Machine, Chili Pepper. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't mind it, but I was I was kind of going a different way when that stuff was coming out. So, uh, yeah. So I, was, you know, at least for my age, that's why. Yeah, that's, that's probably what, Everyone wanted to play Basket Case. Yeah. Everyone wanted to play Bomb Track by Rage. Everyone wanted to play <laughs> Under the Bridge. It was all those kind of things. And then, yeah. yeah, I didn't really get into guitar players until I was maybe 14 or 15. I was yeah, really yeah. late to that game. That's um, all right. They took yeah, different... I don't care. I, it doesn't matter how you got there as long as you get there. <laughs> as long as you get there. Yeah. It was just, I don't think my head was in the right place. I remember being shown, blue, Eric Clapton put out some blues record in like the mid 90s. I forget what it was called. And actually my uncle that you met, he tried to get me on that Eric Clapton record. Um, it wasn't rolling with the, it wasn't the BB King record. It was the Clapton. Oh, from the cradle. Oh, right. Right. You know that record? Record? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. So he tried to get me on that record and. I oh, you mean, you're it. sorry. Your uncle tried to get you to play on that record. No, no, no. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. It was yeah, and it just wasn't at that time when I was so much younger, it wasn't really resonating with me yet. It, I wasn't in that headspace. Uh, so okay. I'm glad that it took me longer to get there because I don't think yeah. I would have been ready for it beforehand. Like when I first started getting into Stevie Ray Vaughan, yeah, yeah, Robin yeah. Ford, you know, all those, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's funny because I'm I'm big into country, and but I wasn't when when I was younger. Right. And when I was younger, I thought you know I kind of fell in that trap that people who were naysayers on country, ah, it's just three chords. It's so simple, you know, and I was listening to yes or something, you know, uh, or Genesis or something. And I was like, yeah, this is, but then as I got older, I really started appreciating it and I just love it, you know? Mm. And then, then you discover the the country players and you're like, holy shit, these guys are monsters. This isn't, this isn't simple music anymore. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it takes some people uh, I kind of envy who, who took to country music when they were like 12, 13, you know, listening to their parents and Merle Haggard albums and they loved it. And mm-hmm. I'm kind of like, wow, that's really cool that you loved it at such a young age. I kind of, I kind of find that music, you need some sort of maturity to, to understand it and enjoy it. But 100%. I'm the same with country. In fact, I, I didn't get a country until I had to start playing it for gigs and, and, it, and it opened a whole world. And I mean, like the, the, 90% of the country gigs I was doing was just pop music, but like it yeah. got, it, it got me into like roots and Americana and, and proper country music. 
Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I can hear that in your plan. So, yeah, let's we'll skip the part where you're, you know, you're kind of getting your chops and learning how to play. Well, we'll, we'll fast forward to um, you deciding university is not for you. You know, you, uh, previously you told a story. Yeah. A guidance counselor told you to to study athletic therapy at university. Holy shit, man! <laughs> we know everything. Yeah, I, sorry, I do this with my guests. <laughs> so, so anyway, athletic therapy out the door. Screw that. Yeah. And uh, that's when you got serious. And your first work, yeah, was with sideman stuff. Well, let me. Tell, I'll tell you why athletic therapy wasn't right for me. Quickly, this is just—it's just kind of funny. Um, yeah. I played a lot of basketball in high school. Yeah. It was music or get, or it was music or basketball. It was like it wasn't like I was going to play college or professionally, but like yeah, I yeah. basketball is a huge part of my life. So they said you probably like athletic therapy, and I never took science after grade ten. I think science is an elective, like you don't have to take it. Yeah, anymore. something like I never that, took yeah. it. For me, I was like, fuck that. Like, why would I take science? It looks hard, yeah. So they took, <laughs> they, they told me to, they somehow convinced me, they conned me into doing athletic therapy. And my first class of university, if this wasn't the reason that I dropped out, I don't know what is, but I showed up. It was like 200 people in a class in a theater. And the lights dimmed and a projector started and the prop was a video from 1989. Yeah, yeah. You know? Hi, welcome to biology. This is uh, my name is Professor Smith, and uh, we're going to talk about. And I was just like, "Oh, I've made a big mistake." <laughs> you, you knew right away. Which yeah. university did you go to for a day? <laughs> uh, the University of Manitoba. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. So you stayed local. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. Well, listen, it's good that you realize quickly. Then, then stick it out and waste fifty grand. Proper education works for many people. For me, yeah. yeah. Not so much. Didn't no, need well, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, not, not to, uh, yeah. If it's not oh, working, it's better that you figure it out early. Yeah. <laughs> so let's skip to the part because um, part that I don't know who you played with because I I was kind of checking on all music to see if maybe you got some credits for it, but I couldn't really find much there. So um, you were doing a lot of sideman work and uh, a lot of studio playing, and uh, uh, this was all kind of before you you joined uh, Brothers Landreth. One thing uh, I, uh, one of my guests was uh, Danik DePel, you know, from Emerson Drive. Love Danik, and, and, yeah. And when I was putting the, those videos together, I stumbled on you because uh, uh, Danik had hired Joey to be his, um, the second guitar player, I guess, for a summer tour. And uh-huh. I saw you with long hair on a, on a pedal steel. There you go. Yeah, so were you, were you playing, was it a lap steel or pedal steel? Mm, <laughs> I don't remember. It was probably <laughs> lap steel. Okay. Oh, was it the CCMAs? I, I, I can't remember, but I saw a video and I'm like, holy shit, that's Ariel Posen. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it was probably lap steel. I mean, I don't play yeah. pedal steel. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there's been a couple times where, yeah. But you had long hair, too. I had to fake it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hair used to be long, <laughs> for sure. So, uh, so tell us, like, who else Who else were you playing with at that time? Because I know you were... You... Yeah. Um, yeah, some of the, some of the guys... I played with for a while was uh, Dallas Smith, Derek Rattan, Jason Blaine, Chad Brownlee, uh, one more girl. Who else? I, I mean, I, I, I you know, the, that scene was great because you at, at some point you start, you go to like the CCMAs and you start house banding or you do all these other yeah, games. Yeah. So you, you basically back up everybody. You play with everybody. I, I basically, like in the Canadian scene, there probably isn't someone that I haven't. Oh, that's great. Yet. But in terms of like playing in their bands and, you know, these, these artists primarily do their thing from September to April or May, you know, they're yeah, yeah. very busy doing other stuff. A lot of them live in the States, but yeah, from, yeah. from May till September. Yeah. They're playing in Canada. Time yeah. they hit the road and they do all the festival circuits yeah, yeah. and they yeah, hire cool. all their guitar, their uh, Canadian bands to, to pack cool. them up. So were you ever through the whole Cedar tree thing here in Kitchener? No. Okay, you were part of that, yeah. Because that's no, and, and for the country scene, I didn't do a lot of recording. I I was primarily just live, so, like a touring guy. I, like yeah. a touring guy. A lot of the recording stuff I do was was in other scenes. I have done some. I have done some recordings. Like I was on the last couple of Doc Walker records, and oh, cool. Uh, used to record for One More Girl, and just uh, and Dallas Smith, and a couple other projects like that. But it was primarily live. 
Oh, that's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah, I, I interviewed Jason Blaine as well. Yeah, so hey. him, him and Danik are, uh, yeah, they've been in Nashville for 20 years now. But, uh, but yeah, all their playing. 20 is years? Holy shit. Yeah, I think, I think he went down there in 05. So maybe 15. Uh, I love those dudes. Yeah. Blaine, yeah. Blaine and I have spent a lot of time on the road together. We Oh, great. We've yeah, he's done, super, uh, super nice guy. Super nice. Oh, guy. he's lovely. He's a very charitable guy too. Yeah, he's mm. uh, he, he likes to give back. A uh, great uh, great story. I really enjoy talking to him. Kind of how did you get into the uh, Brothers Landreth with uh, Joey and David? How, uh, you see, you were mentioning just earlier you you guys were uh, grew up together. So. I've grown up with those. They're some of my oldest friends. We've been playing music together, you know, since we were out of high school. Joey's ex girlfriend or girlfriend at the time in high school was in my band in, in high school. <laughs> and, you know, I just like very, it's like, you know, I've known each other from a very long, for a very long time. Dave was in my first band and, and yeah, so they started, they started their band together and they were a four piece. Uh, they'd be the occasional time that right, right, they, yeah. they'd expand. So I would play with them as a five okay. piece. Okay. And then they, they were just in a position to, to make some changes. And, and I just started playing with them. It was a cool, it was a cool band. I mean, because you guys, you and Joey have a lot of similarities in your playing. I mean, you're both doing. That was fun. So did Joey get the, the tuning concepts and this kind of stuff from you? No, I mean we're very like very like minded. Yeah, I know he's listening to a lot. <laughs> so of you you Kevin. both got to the same place, but different. Yeah, I know he's a big Kevin fan, Derek fan, Lowell fan. Yeah, very you know, grew, grown up, growing up listening to a lot of the same music and same influences and like minded interests musically. Yeah, 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 no, it's a great band. So were you on? Um, you were on the Let It Lie album because that was a good uh, album. No. So you were mostly just touring with that. Yeah, I mean, I jo- I st- I started playing with them after that was out. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Like the live, okay. or sorry, not live, uh, the Undercover Brothers album. Right, on, that was the next one. Yeah, yeah. Seven, their latest record I'm on. Yeah, yeah. Actually, they're just coming out with one. I just saw they uh, got one called 87. Uh, so it's out already. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I played on it too. Yeah, that, we recorded that like three years ago already. You did, uh, there's some uh, video out there of uh, the Brothers Lander with, with you in there. Um Oh, I'm gonna squeeze some of that in there. Doing doing some covers of the band. really cool oh yeah yeah. that's we band i'm in we good do band the band the band is a good band i had interviewed colin linden who did a lot of work that, it was cool to talk about it because it's you know that's well i don't know that's, band. it's royalty man it's royalty, it's royalty. Um, <laughs> for whatever reasons we don't even have to get into it uh took a hiatus and uh the hiatus kind of coincided with your wife getting uh, accepted at school in Ireland and you started all over again. And that's, that's kind of where uh, the last album started to form. And uh, here we are. <laughs> yeah. In some ways that's yeah. And definitely went on a hiatus right when we moved for a couple of years, definitely fed into uh, focusing on solo projects. Big time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, I'm, just, I'm just like going through that in my head. I was like, yeah, no, I'll, I'll remind yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll remind you what happened. No, I mean it was a it's a cool story. You've told that. Uh, you know, um, you're out there in Ireland. <laughs> what the hell do I do in Ireland? And uh, you just started booking yourself. But this is cool. So you um, you were ended up somehow uh, hooking up with Josh Smith that he was touring, and you ended up kind of co billing a tour together, which is which is great. I mean, you're both incredible players, but totally different players. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't somehow. It was, it was just like Josh is a friend of mine, uh, the guy that books or booked that tour for for Josh. Also, was doing some booking for me in in the UK, and it just made sense that uh, yeah, it was just a, it was just an opportunity 
to, to double up on it, you know? And it was a, yeah, I guess it was technically my first proper tour as a solo act. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. It was it awesome. Was great. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a great player. He's a great, oh. but, but different, right? I mean, he's a, he's more of um uh, how do you say this? Like more like a guitar player. A guitar player is guitar player, kind of like yeah, yeah. You know, I you want to, talk I, about I want to get my face ripped off and just be blown away. I'm gonna watch him, and then I'm gonna go cry on the way home. Yeah, you want and, to talk stamina and dedication and honesty, and you you know, I was talking about sitting on your bed from all those years and like putting yeah, in two thousand yeah. hours. He's been doing that since he was a kid. He started yeah. gigging it as a child. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's been yeah. at it a long time. He cares so deeply about the music he makes. A very different player than what you do. Like I said, like you, oh, you yeah, got yeah. you clearly got the chops that when you want to go nuts, you can go nuts just like anybody can. But your your base is more of being a lyrical player. You know, you're you got it's all it's all it's a lot of melodies. It's a lot of walking away humming what you just played, and which is great. And I think that that casts you you know, potentially to a lot of, uh, a much wider audience than a, a bunch of guys standing like this watching you play, you know, like, I mean, you it, should be able to get the girlfriends out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's, it's just, there's no right or wrong. Like it doesn't oh, matter. No, no, no. I'm just and, saying. The, the and I'm not saying different. that you were saying yeah. otherwise, but you know, I like, I love to sing. I like to play and I like to listen to songs with words and, sing along and sing harmony yeah. this is where i'm at you know as you've seen at a show like there's a lot of guitar playing in the show there's a lot yeah. of guitar moments oh way yeah, more yeah, than, yeah, than yeah. there are on the records right yeah yeah and i just kind of like it that way a lot of my favorites are, are like that too you know you you we want this the record experience and the live experience uh, some things that are live don't translate as well and i'm just yeah. talking about specifically for what i do and that was a big part. That was a big reason of doing the familiar ground thing. You know, I do a version of the song John uh, Angeline by John Martin. Yeah, yeah, that's which a cool. Is a, it's a big guitar tune. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's a it's a lovely song <clears throat> to cover. It's a lovely song. There's a lot of singing on it. Really nice opportunity for harmonies, but it's a big guitar moment song. Yeah. And you know, I could put that on an album, like a studio version, but it just wouldn't have the same. The most natural thing for me to do is put out songs of yeah. like, say, not guitar music. And that's not nothing wrong with guitar music. Yeah, yeah. that's not, not where, what you are. Yeah, it's just not where I'm at with yeah. where I'm creating. But I'm a guitar player and that's what people know me for. So like, I want to make sure that I'm paying respect to every end for the people that have heard some songs and come to a show because they like the songs and want to hear them. I want to make sure they're covered for the people that are fans of the guitar playing and all that shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's smart. Make sure they're covered. It's so smart. The people that are there because they like, I don't know, the singing or they like yeah. no, that's my good. drummer. <laughs> then I have them covered. You know what I mean? That's I want to make sure that there's a little bit for everybody and that everyone, it's not just like, it's like saying you're only going to, yeah, I don't know. That's yeah, kind of like a John Mayer thing in a sense, what you do. There's a yeah, comparison. I'm very influenced yeah. by that. Yeah. Um, you know, he's a great, he's a great singer, great songs. Great player and yeah. a great band, <laughs> you know? <Exactly. laughs> so exactly. there you go. And, and the same thing where it's like the records aren't, aren't it's not guitar music. Yeah, there's yeah, they don't go on and on. His records don't go on and on. No, there's there's yeah. there's a lot of moments. There's a lot of thought and effort yeah, yeah. for the sounds and the parts. And then you go to a show and, and he's playing. He's stretching out. He's going for it. And he lets the band stretch out too. It's such a, it's such a musical experience. It's really wonderful. Oh, that's great. So there you go. I'll say it. you're the Winnipeg John Mayer. Ah, let's not go with that. <laughs> I mean, that's not what I'm going for. But I know. Okay, I'm just joking around. Not that that's an insult. That's an. That's no, it's an, not an insult. That's a nice compliment. Too. <laughs> yeah, take it as a compliment. Very much. Um, <laughs> if you could touch on this, three things that you've said. Um, which was really cool that that leaves an impact uh, that you know I think musicians should understand uh, if they don't um, what drives an audience you had three things you know singing high playing really fast and dynamics yeah you, can, you know you know my my lines man it's well it's it's pretty cool it's it's kind of bang on but I use that in a different way that's not how I use it I I basically say the way I say it usually is that the focus is on dynamics and feel right. Yeah. And the way it's the way you just said it made it sound like 
yeah, you got to sing high, you got to play fast. <laughs> the way I the way I normally say it. No, is, you're you're right. You're right. Yeah, the way I, I just so like no one's getting the wrong idea here. <laughs> you know, it's all about for me is dynamics, and you know, there's two, th- there's three things <laughs> that people react to when they, when they're going to the show. They they really react to someone singing high. Yeah. You know, because it sounds impressive. Sure. They respond to someone playing something really fast, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah it's impressive, sure. right? But the thing they react to the most, and they don't even realize it, is dynamics. It's just yeah. like when BB King That's would true. take a solo or like take the last chords before the solo, and the drummer just boom, snare on yeah, one, yeah, and it, bring, yeah. it brings right down. Yeah, yeah. People are like, whoa, what just happened? Yeah, and then you start from scratch again, and then you take it up, and then you bring it back down. It's dynamics. It's a story. It's, it's a tension and release. That those are the things that are, yeah. for me, the most important. And the no, most, you're you're right. You're I right. like to experience the most when when listening to music. Yeah, um, and, and it's true in recording too. I've seen you know engineers talk about that. You know, oh, if, you, yeah. if you're crowding too many tracks, kind of at a same volume. Yeah, you, know, you can't differentiate. You got to have you know. Um, it's kind of like it's some guy who was kind of saying he was comparing it to kind of photography you know when, when you blur the background yeah. you know you look super clear now you're looking super clear because you blurred the background right so right. it's like this sounds bigger because you made this quieter you know so yeah no dynamics yeah. is such an important part of music for sure yeah so i just wanted to make uh yeah 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 it wasn't a rule but you know play fast is good for the audience you do that I mean, I, I, I'm not good at playing fast, so oh, people don't come in here and do a whole lot of that. It's you, just can, not my... you can do it when you want to. I've seen it. I've seen lots of clips, and I saw it live. So, uh, so <laughs> there. there. So um, before my battery, our batteries die out here, because it's, it's, been, <laughs> it's been a blast talking to you, because like I said, I, I am a fan. Josh Smith, Kirk Fletcher, Mark Letary, Greg Cock, and Guthrie Trap. Like, you're there. You're in that group. Uh, with all these guys and it's uh so it's it's a pleasure to talk to you but since it is i did label this thing guitar players in isolation uh it, you know probably most people who are watching this already know your gear because you've talked about it a ton of times but that's just for the sake of repeating let's uh talk about your two rocks and you know some of your signature guitar pedals and if you sure. can so your favorite amp is still uh, is still the two rock yeah the, the, yeah. the two rock is the amp it's the amp I've always been chasing. Basically, I've all, I've always been after that. It's like the Fender on steroids in a way, yeah. or like that that Dumble kind of sound, but not like the Overdrive Supreme. It's that clean Robin Ford sound. It's that Stevie Ray Vaughan steel steel string singer type of thing, the John Mayer thing. You know, it's like a very specific sound. I've always been after that. I've gone I've gone through all of the other Dumble style amps and. Yeah. It's just, yeah, I can't play a gig without it. It's just, it's, it's the headroom. It's the dynamics, you know, when, when you tune down lower, lower wattage amps, which are awesome and are great for me for recording and stuff like that. They just don't handle the bottom end as well. And it compresses a lot quicker, which I don't like. And it just breaks up, which I, I don't want to happen. I want to control all of the dynamics on my end. So the two rock is just, bottom end but not too much it's top end but not too much the mid range is great and it's just headroom and body and just hugeness and more so than just how the amps are you know my dudes eli and mac and everyone at the company are family they're just such great people that's great they're true friends and i just i can't say enough good things about that those guys and, and the ants, but they're in, yeah, they're integral to what I do because yeah, yeah, it's just because they are. <laughs> so I'm wondering if there's some something to this on the tuning, like you just kind of mentioned it. So uh, my last interview was with uh, Doug Johnson. I don't know if you know him. He's uh, Doug Johnson, big uh, pedal steel player. Right, it was my first oh. guest. Who was a pedal steel player, and he's been on countless albums in Canadian country music. He's one of the kind of the top. Actually, he's uh, nominated this year for a CCMA for Pedal Steel Player of the Year. But oh, nice. Who does he play with? It, like we said in the interview, the list of who he hasn't played with is pretty small. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, what he talked about, and I'm wondering if there's something similar there because of your gauges of strings, is that, you know, he, he has to play with, uh, you know, a Nashville 400, which is, a, you know, a PV. And it's got to yeah, be yeah. 
huge, big wattage, like a, like a Fender twin won't even do them any good, you know? And I, uh, and I'm wondering if that, if there's, if that's something to do with, you know, as you play with those bigger gauge strings that you just need more wattage, more headroom. Yeah. I'm not sure that it has anything to do necessarily with the gauge. It's okay. just more so the lower you tune, like if you're even playing in drop D, you notice if you're playing through like one of your deluxes over there yeah. or are those deluxes? Uh, one's a Vibra Lux and one's a Deluxe. Oh, nice. Okay, so both great amps, but like once you get past three, they start breaking up pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And if you're like playing a telly and you even go to drop D, you're going to notice that you're going to start like it flubs out a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just that kind of thing. You could be playing with nines or tens and it'll still do that. Yeah, yeah. So it's just so more you're extreme playing, when you're down to B. Yeah. Yeah, B standard. It's yeah. just like, okay. <laughs> You just need to, it's like matching the strings with the tension and whatnot. You've got to match the wattage to the the key you're playing in anyway. That sounds kind of weird, but it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. just like, I've had to do a lot of fly out gigs with backline when I can't get a two rock festivals. You know, as long as you can put a microphone on it, it's, it's all right, I guess. But if I get a deluxe reverb, which I love, I have a... I have a 64 Deluxe Reverb, maybe one of my favorite amps I have. On my gig, if I end up with a, an amp that's only 20 watts or something like that, yeah, like I'll struggle percent. because it'll break up a lot faster. I can't control my dynamics the same way. Yeah, and yeah. it's going to make me play differently. And it's not about being loud. Yeah. It's not about being loud. It's about just having that headroom. There's yeah, a big yeah, difference. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I get you. Because you're kind of a guy who's kind of playing it uh, on seven, you know, a, a lot of the time. And then so you... Yeah, you you want the tone at seven, but you still want to be able to go to ten at certain ports, right? And yeah, but like exactly. And yeah. what, for those that don't understand what uh, you mean, is like on the guitar, my the volume is it like yeah. between six and eight always, or five right, and right. seven? Yeah, just in case anyone didn't understand. And that's yeah, yeah. yeah I'm I'm at ten, maybe ten percent of the net. Yeah, kind of the the peak of the solo when the drummer is yeah. going nuts, and you're, you're, you 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 got to bust through that. You got to yeah. Kind of, Clear through those symbols. Exactly. <laughs> so you're a bit of a pedal guy too, but have you? Um, you know, there's there's lots of stuff online of uh, you going through your your pedals and yeah, kind of kind of suitcase chrome dome thing. Uh, uh, what's what's <laughs> it called? Schmitterays, yeah. Schmitterays, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, Josh uses that too. There's a bunch of guys now using those. Um, but uh, have you? You know, just because you're you know you're a great player. Uh, have you? played some gigs where you just went like, you know, maybe just like one overdrive pedal or, or do, do you, yeah. Kidding? Of course. Cool. Here's the, here's the thing. Like, yeah, I'm known for using pedals and I love them. Like, oh, do sure. I enjoy them? Yes. Do they bring me joy? Yes. <laughs> Does, is it nice to have a lot of sound? Yes. And a lot of my songs have, uh, you know, have tremolo or maybe like a bigger reverb or a fuzz or a less yeah, sound, yeah. whatever. Well, you're a trio too, right? So you want to break it up. Regardless if it's a trio or a big band, it's all nice things to have, but you strip that away, you're still a guitar player. You know, it's yeah, still, yeah. it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. As long as I have an amp that has headroom, you know, if there's, I don't really like amp overdrive, but if I'm stuck with that, or one overdrive pedal with yeah. reverb on an amp. Yeah, you're good. I can make it work. Excellent, excellent. Um, oh, I mean, I grew up playing guitar. I didn't grow up with pedal boards, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So, trust me, it's it's something I love, and I st I will always use pedals. I, I I truly love them, but I'm not defined by them. Like you take that away, we're still we're still on the same journey, you know. You but you know how to use them. I mean, it's. Uh, you get some really cool tones and the way you, like you said, you do, you got that low tuning and kind of a, a thing that you, you do a lot of it is fuzz. And with that low tuning, I mean, that, uh, that rattles, uh, some of those, your teeth, whatever those fillers. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you've got I'm your, glad, uh, I'm glad my nonsense at least is make, makes sense to some people. Maybe. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's killer. It's killer. You have your own, um, uh, signature paddles. You might as well, uh, touch on that uh broadcast pedal looks cool i mean sounds even sure. better yeah but it does look cool <laughs> thank you man. uh did you yeah have, the, did you have input on the actual design of it like the, the look oh yeah yeah. Uh, yeah cool the original broadcast so mine the the enclosure mine is like a vertical based enclosure right yeah 
Uh, I'm staring at it, but it's tied into a pedal board. Otherwise, I'd, I'd show it like this. But yeah, yeah. I, you know, can, I can cut one out. For it's you. like this, but the original broadcast is horizontal. Yeah, so yeah. we just took the the enclosure, flipped it, and simplified the controls a bit. Made it silicon from germanium. I use it a lot. In fact, for recording, it's my number one weapon. It's so versatile for recording. Excellent. I love it, and I'm biased, but I think I'm allowed to be biased because yeah, that's, yeah, that's, point cool. of, that's the point of a signature piece of gear. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's something that is that is that an always on pedal for you? It depends. Yeah, yeah. it can. It, it often is. The thing oh, about okay. it is that it does a really good, like a clean boost. Yeah. It does a really good low overdrive, a really yeah. good medium overdrive. Yeah. Um, and it does a fuzz, but oh, cool. I think it shines also as like a boost. I guess I, so is, it, is there two, uh, I, I can't, I mean, I've seen it, but I, I can't remember now. Is there two switches on it? There's a it? volume and a gain, and then there's a switch to turn a low cut on or off. Oh, okay. But there's not like a separate fuzz switch. No, but that the original one does. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. The original one is a two channel. So this, this one is all in one, but it's all dependent on how much you're driving it to get the fuzz sound out. Exactly. And if you open it up, there's trimmers on the inside. So you can actually give ah. it more fuzz. You can give it less. You can run it from 9 volts to 24 volts. Oh, boy. So you can run, like, if you want to give it a lot more headroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very it's cool. Really cool box. Very yeah. cool. The other thing that I heard that, uh, not for gigging, but um, this was kind of cool. You do it for uh, in the studio. You have a, a Victoria... Uh, Vibrato. Reverberato. Yeah. <laughs> oh shit. I, I just call that it one up. <laughs> I just call it it's a lot easier. It's like a big box. <laughs> yeah. So it's a harmonic tremolo. Yeah, so it's it's the size of a Marshall Plexi. Yeah, yeah that's why you but it's it. it's wired so the, the harmonic tremolo is is based off of like early sixties concert amps or super yeah, yeah. amps. Yeah, yeah. And the reverb is actually based off of a I think an early '60s twin reverb, just okay. the reverb, but it's beautiful. It's that's awesome. It's my number one piece of gear for recording. I need to have. I need to have that. Um, so when you're gigging, is your tremolo pedal like a, just a normal tremolo, or is it harmonic too? Uh, I I basically only use harmonic. Oh, okay. So which for, which, for uh, which pedal which pedal gives you a har a, a harmonic tremolo? Well, there's a lot out there. I uh, mean, you've probably seen the Strymon Flint. Oh, okay, yeah. That, that does a really good like, harmonic. Right. The wall, there's a walrus audio. There's the surfy trim. Yeah, I um, guess the, the, the flint would be the one I know. Yeah. There's a bunch. Yeah, cool. The tough circuit. A lot of people kind of shy away from it, but it's a special sound. Cool, cool. And guitars, you're, uh, you know, we talked about the mule, and uh, but you're, you're also um, the Collins. That's what I think you had out when you were in Toronto. You had uh, you had the Collins, so you play that a lot. And, yeah, and the sewer still, and that's uh, that's you, yeah. man. Pardon? <laughs> that's that's you. If you want to come out and see you, that's that's what you'll be playing. Most likely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Most likely, yeah. That's great, great. I mean, thanks a lot for your time, man. This is uh, I did anytime. This is such like... a nice way to spend the evening. Thanks <laughs> for having me. Great, yeah. So we've got the single. It's going to be out by the time you're watching this. So you know, probably the best way to get. Uh, Coming back is to go, I'm going to guess, go on Bandcamp so uh, so at least uh, they can actually pay for it, um, really? download it, and then it's on your computer forever. Forever. <laughs> yeah, that, that uh, and then I guess just watch out because you're probably going to leak out some more tunes, I bet. Yeah, there may be some more music to follow, <laughs> probably. All right, man. Listen, <laughs> uh, enjoy the rest of lockdown. <laughs> yeah, man. And, uh, I, think, I think we still might be in it for a while, but hey. Thanks so much, man. Uh, I pleasure, really appreciate man. it. Nice to hang. Thank you. I'm just going to turn the recorder off. If you are still watching, then I trust you've really enjoyed this interview. A huge thanks goes out to Ariel Posen for taking the time to chat with me. I really enjoyed it, and I hope you did so too. Uh, this has been my 20th episode, so a huge thanks to all the guests that have participated so far. I've truly had a blast doing these interviews and getting to know so many amazing guitar players. So. Please subscribe, hit that bell notification if you haven't done so already, and leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. I should have another interview out in about a week or so. So if you subscribe, you'll get that notification, and I'll see you then. All right, take care. Bye.